Jack West, MD. I'm an associate clinical professor in medical oncology at City of Hope Cancer Center in the Los Angeles area, uh, and also founder and president of Grace. Uh, Isabel, can you tell us who you are and what you are? Sure. Um, my name is Isabel Preschigal. I am a thoracic oncologist at Memorial Sloan Kettering, and I am very excited to be here today speaking to all of you. And Joan. Yes. Hi, everyone. I'm Joan Schiller. I'm a medical oncologist um, living now in Northern Virginia. I was formerly the deputy director of the Cancer Center at UT Southwestern and also of the Shar Cancer Center in um, in Northern Virginia as part of ANOVA. Excellent. I'm glad to be with you. Let's talk about another target. Uh, we have known about the mutation KRAS, and there's actually many types of KRAS mutations, which is itself an important point. One of the common ones is called G21C, and only in the last year we've gotten a new FDA-approved therapy called Lumacras or Sotorasib, an oral therapy that has activity, uh, and it's been generally given in previously treated patients uh, with a KRAS mutation that's about 13% of patients with lung cancer. And it's been associated with a response rate of about 37% uh, and uh, responses last 10, 12 months, 11 months or so. And overall encouraging results. Um, I'm just interested in uh, how you're using this and uh, are you using it only in previously treated patients? Um, do you think that this is just a foot in the door for future KRAS inhibitors, or is is this going to be a lasting, frequently used go-to drug for you know many years to come? Uh, Isabel, can I start with you about you know how big a step is sotorasib and and um, you know, where, where do you see its place? Sure. So I, I'm very excited about finally having an approval for this orphan child KRAS mutation that has just been left out. So I'm happy we have something. Um, I think that, you know, while the response rate is beautiful for this drug, the waterfall plot looks great. You know, majority of patients had a beautiful response and fairly quickly, I think the the duration of response is what is a somewhat upsetting to me. Um, the And then you had also asked Jack about who I'm giving this drug to. Um, so outside of the trial, I haven't had many patients on this drug yet. Um, I've seen a couple older patients with this alteration and it's been challenging to get it um, approved, you know, yeah. in the frontline yeah. setting. Um, and I think but in the second line setting, I have had some good success tweaking the dose a little bit in regards to toxicity, but, um, but I've had some good experiences and I'm just happy to finally have something for these patients. And Joan, what's your, I, I mean, I, I'm not surprised that it's a little harder to get in the first line setting, but it's really not studied there very well, nor is a 37% response rate, even if it's a little better if we give it earlier than later, um, that's not necessarily a targeted therapy like Tegriso, where you see a 75, 80% response rate and you feel like it it clearly is compelling, must be first line. So, you know, what's what's your view of this? Is this uh, a placeholder until we get better ones or, or yeah, what? Well, hopefully we will get better ones, but I think there was some data in the small portion of patients who did not receive prior chemotherapy. Yeah, it was. It, and it looked relatively good. So th these are the data for the the small number of patients, 13 patients yeah. who had gotten immunotherapy, but no chemo uh, response rates, 69%. Yeah. And, yeah and, a seven, and again, small number of patients, but a 17 month overall survival. So making you wonder about whether it should be also tested in the first line setting as well. Okay. I should mention that patient was, um, was over 80 and performance status was somewhat tenuous, right. and probably not the best chemo IO candidate and PDL1 <laughs> was zero. Um, should have mentioned that. 